the media uploaded by LGBT Anonymous does not represent the Anonymous movement or the LGBT movement. They are just ideas that have been thought of as worth watching due to the fact that they promote the freeing of humanity in some way shape or form. If you would like to learn and grow with us then please subscribe, join our social networks and feel free to email us with content that you would like to see uploaded to our channel. We at LGBT Anonymous acknowledge and support all gender identities. Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Bethany Cotton. She's the Wildlife Program Director for Wild Earth Guardians. Guardians works to protect and restore wildlife, wild places, and wild rivers in the American West. A native Cascadian, Bethany now calls the Southern Rockies home. So what I'd like to talk to you about today is um, a program called Wildlife Services, which sounds like a wonderful thing. I mean, it's like servicing wildlife. And um, their, own, their own description is that they provide federal leadership and skill to resolve wildlife interactions with threatened public health and safety. So it sounds like a great deal, but it's actually really horrible. So can you tell me what Wildlife Services is? Sure. So Wildlife Services is a program of the Animal, Plant, and Health Inspection Service, which is itself an agency within the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And it is, as you noted, about the most ironically named program you could ever think of. Uh, and that is intentional. Um, the program used to have a name that was more reflective of what it actually does, and um, there have been efforts to revise the naming and the references to this program to really disguise what's going on. But Wildlife Services spend millions, literally millions, of taxpayer dollars every year to poison, trap, aerial gun, um, and otherwise kill literally millions of individual uh, animals. Um, at the behest, really, of the livestock industry. So it's it's about removing largely native carnivores from the landscape, also lots of birds, um, because there are folks who don't like the fact that those wild animals um, exist, especially um, in areas of urban wildland uh, borders. So when you say um, kill animals, like, can you give me some sort of idea of the scope of of what we're talking about? I mean, is it like, you know, 15 rabid coyotes, or, or what are we talking about? No, <clears throat> we're talking in often the numbers of tens of thousands of individual animals, and it depends on the year, and it also it can be difficult to get those numbers from Wildlife Services. We spend a lot of time sending Freedom of Information Act FOIA requests in to get that kind of data. Uh, it, they're loath to disclose it, but we're talking literally millions of animals, um, a lot of coyotes, uh, but also wolves, bears, bobcats, lynx, uh, lots of ravens and crows, um, and then a lot of non-target species. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the different tools that wildlife services use is, are non-discriminatory, and they can't specifically target uh, the animal that they actually are trying to kill. So we've seen a lot of incidences, unfortunately, of companion animals dying, mostly um, folks who've taken their dogs out um, to recreate on public lands who've encountered um, traps or poison, uh, literally in, in the hundreds of dogs have been killed, um, and then endangered species, um, including Mexican wolves, um, grizzly bears, lots of species that actually have federal protection that are uh, unintentionally but uh, not very carefully killed by wildlife services. You know, I a, a bird that was very dear to me when I was growing up, and it's still dear to me, but I don't live in the in the Great Plains area anymore. Um, that I seem to recall them killing a lot of is uh, red-winged blackbirds. Yeah, that's um, don't right. they? Don't they? My understanding is that they kill a lot of those to 
protect the interests of those growing bird seed or sunflower seeds for feed for other birds. So it's always struck me as as really horribly ironic. Is, is that accurate that it's for the it's as red winged blackbirds are killed mainly for the the bird seed producers? The, the way they talk about it is just crop damage. So it could be any number of crops. I actually don't know specifically if it's uh, around growing bird seed um, purposely, but it wouldn't surprise me. Um, certainly, it is all at the behest of, um, of the agriculture industry that complains about losses due to wildlife. So we... You said earlier that it used to have a more accurate name. What, what was that? Well, it's actually, they've had, the agencies had several names, um, and the history goes back nearly 100 years. So back in 1931, the Congress passed the Animal um, Damage Control Act, and that's what led to um, the establishment of these various forms of programs and agencies within the federal government whose purpose was to actually kill, go out and kill wildlife. Um, so it's a really long history of targeting um, animals and specifically targeting native carnivores. Uh, so that was the first act back in 1931, and it's, the act's been amended several times to sound less ominous, even though millions of animals are still killed each year. Uh, and, and there have been, there's been criticism of the program for really quite a long time as well. So early wildlife activists, a woman named Rosalie Edge, way back in the 1930s, uh, distributed a pamphlet talking about how, what a waste of taxpayer dollars it was and how ill-advised it was to go out and kill wildlife. And then uh, we saw that Back in the 70s, there were actually hearings and a report produced um, by Congress uh, about what really how wasteful this was and how ill-advised. And that actually led to some executive orders under the next administration that uh, prohibited the use of certain poisons on public land. But unfortunately, those executive orders were rescinded by subsequent presidents, and we're seeing use of those poisons again um, and some of these really cruel tools um, that have happened. So, it's it's an interesting thing, but this has really been around for a long time. And we know that actually the last gray wolf was killed in Yellowstone National Park uh, in 1926 by the Park Service. The Park Service thought that they were doing a service um, to the area and to the park itself by removing wolves. And by the 40s, almost all the grizzly bears were gone across the landscape. We used to have at least 2 million wolves in the United States, and now we're down to a few thousand, and they're a struggling species. Um, and that was really intended targeting of those species by the government. And um, what, are, what are some of the – you mentioned it in passing, but can you, can you go ahead and give more detail on some of the um, um, methods that are used to kill the predators? Sure. So we see all sorts of different um, tools. You hear about aerial gunning. That's used to target larger, um, specifically canines, like coyotes and wolves. Uh, we, their snares are used, various poisons. Um, perhaps the most common poison is called an M44, and it's actually a sodium cyanide capsule, um, and a fetid bait lure is used. So it's it basically smells like a meal to the animal, and then when the animal comes and pulls on that lure, um, it releases a trigger that's sort of like a, and it used to actually be a shotgun shell that then releases the sodium cyanide, and, and that powder becomes aerosolized um, and is lethal uh, very quickly uh, if it's directly ingested. Uh, and those, the prevalence of those across the landscape is truly, truly astounding. They're most prevalent in the West, uh, but they are used across the landscape. Um, they're in New Mexico, they're in Oregon, they're in Texas, uh, they're unfortunately in a whole bunch of different places, and they're also on public lands, um, which is actually something I didn't know and was sort of shocked to learn 
um, in the last year that that this is something that's done on public lands. So this is this is not only um, coyotes or skunks or whomever who goes on to um, you know some sort of agribusiness land, but it's also um, these are to protect um, sheep or cows who are grazing on public lands. Yes, absolutely. And I can um, give you a specific year. So that in 1963, and this was one of the first years that there was actually a report about um, the predecessor of Wildlife Services, and, and you asked earlier, and I actually didn't tell you one of the names, but um, the program in the 60s was called Predatory Animal and Rodent Control, uh, which is clearly a little more uh, of a legitimate name, or at least a name that reflects the, the purpose of the program. Um, in 1963 alone, 20,780 lynx and bobcats were killed. 89,780 coyotes and 12,779 wolves, just in 1963 alone. Um, and and you mentioned the uh, the M44s. Um, what about compound 1080? Is that yeah. is that part of the M44? Or is that a separate thing? That's a separate thing, and it's used specifically. That's an. Um, I, I want to make sure I'm correct about this, but my understanding is that that's an abicide, so it specifically targets birds, um, and even more specifically, is often used for corvid. So, uh, 1080 is often used specifically for ravens, and. Um, it's an interesting situation because we actually have a pending lawsuit challenging um, the, the use of that and the failure to do a National Environmental Policy Act analysis of the environmental impacts of the use of that in the state of Nevada. And the state claims that the state itself, regardless of Wildlife Services' help, would go out and do this work. But uh, it's actually the state doesn't have authorization to use Compound 1080. Um, the federal government does under uh, CIFRA, which is the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, um, it's the federal law that regulates the use of pesticides um, nas nationally. So um, 1080 is in use usually uh, to target birds. Um, I want to read you something that I've I've read about 1080. Um, um, first off, one teaspoon can kill 100 people. Um, mm -hmm. There's no known antidote, et cetera, et cetera. It's um, it's called sodium fluoroacetate, and um, it's the EPA puts it in the toxicity category one, which is highest degree. And it also just I mean it's bad enough to kill them, but also 1080 poisoning they die slowly. Um, Symptoms yep. begin to appear about a half hour or more and last from hours to days. They include a cycle of repeated vomiting, involuntary hyperextension of the limbs, convulsions, collapse. Uh, victims experience heightened anxiety, hallucination, intense pain, and depression. It's also so potent that animals eating tainted carcasses, even months after the animal has died, succumb to secondary poisoning. So it's right, really and that's a stuff. really serious concern, the secondary poisoning issue. Yeah, go ahead about that. Well, it's just that if you don't go and then collect the carcasses of those animals who did die of the direct poisoning, then you get that secondary poisoning, and it often occurs uh, with species that um, that use uh, already dead animals as a food source, um, which include listed endangered species like the California condor uh, and other already very imperiled species. Uh, so there's a lot of these unintended but most definitely foreseeable consequences to the use of these highly, highly toxic products um, on our public lands. And do the, does the, the cyanide, <clears throat> do the sodium cyanide devices also kill secondarily? Because I know in Africa that one of the things that's happening right now is poachers are putting cyanide waste onto salt licks to kill um, um, to kill elephants for their mm -hmm. ivory, mm -hmm. 
And one of the things that happens there is that that's ending up doing mass poisonings of everybody who comes to eat the elephants as well. And does, does the cyanide in, in the um, uh, M44s, um, does that also cause secondary poisoning? It, it's not one of our biggest concerns about the M44s because that's something that it happens sort of instantaneously and it's not it's not fully ingested through the bloodstream. It just goes into the mouth and then death is nearly instantaneous. So it's it's a little different than compound 1080. Uh, and I don't know of uh, of proven incidences of secondary poisoning, but I wouldn't take my word for it necessarily that that's not happening on the landscape. So basically what we're describing so far sounds really atrocious. Can you, um, can you put on your evil hat for a moment and give me the rationale for this program from the perspective of either um, the um, people who work for the agency or the agribusiness people or, or or whomever? Well, I'm not that great at wearing the evil hat, but I will tell you that their talking points is that they're providing food for the nation and that they need to be able to do that at the lowest cost possible to keep food costs low uh, and that they are struggling financially in the face of predation from um, wild animals. Uh, and they certainly do a lot of yelling and screaming about um, what they say are, are high costs due to um, impacts from depredation of livestock um, or damage to crops because of the presence of wildlife. And once again, um, well, I, you, I guess you don't know this, but a few weeks ago I interviewed um, Mike Meese, who works on Buffalo Field Campaign. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we talked about were the public lands ranching uh, programs where the ranchers will get um, access to land at what is about a fifth or is a tenth of the going market rate. So when they complain that they're being harmed in their business, in those cases at least, um, they're already getting grotesquely subsidized. Yes. They're definitely heavily, heavily, heavily subsidized. And not only are they heavily subsidized, but they're doing an enormous amount of damage. I mean, the, the reason we're talking about the need to lift the lesser prairie chicken and the greater sage grouse under the Endangered Species Act, um, there are impacts from other industries, but there are huge impacts from public lands grazing. Um, when the grazing is too heavy, then there's not enough forage for native species. Um, it encourages the... Uh, the removal of native species like sage grouse and the incursion of non-native and species invasive species like cheatgrass, which then increases fire risk. Um, and there's a lot of damage to riparian areas that are um, those areas along streamside habitats that are key for lots of species if um, cows aren't fenced out of those areas. So we're seeing public lands grazing as a huge threat to a lot of native species, and the public is is subsidizing that through the taxpayers. Uh, and we actually at Guardians uh, have a program to buy out um, those public land grazing allotments um, and to return the land to a more natural state and to make sure that that habitat is viable for all sorts of species. Um, and we're working specifically in um, the Gila Wilderness, which is actually our country's first designated wilderness. This year is the 50th anniversary of the Wilderness Act, and, and that was really a vision of Aldo Leopold, um, and he envisioned specifically the Gila being a wilderness area, um, and it is, but it also is really impacted by public lands grazing, and it's a primary reason why we see uh, that the Mexican wolf is in so much trouble because of those conflicts between public lands grazers um, and the Mexican wolf and because of policies that allow the lethal removal of wolves. And the real irony is that there are non-lethal control measures. I mean, first of all, the numbers that are touted by the industry just aren't accurate. The, the depredation numbers are low, and in most cases there are programs that reimburse ranchers for any take of um, livestock by uh, by wolf or, or by other species, um, state programs and federal programs, some of which are subsidized by conservation groups. 
Uh, and then we also uh, are just seeing that uh, that really there are a lot of tools that you can use that are non-lethal, and, and we're seeing a lot of ranchers shifting to non-lethal control, and they call themselves often predator-friendly or carnivore-friendly ranchers where um, – Science is showing that, in fact, if you come in and you kill a bunch of species, that you end up with, with more, that coyotes react by having larger litter sizes, um, that they very rapidly fill in a, a unoccupied area, um, and often you end up with more animals than you had before. And I've spoken with um, various ranchers who just said we've just – we learn, live in harmony with these animals, and we don't see them causing trouble uh, with our, with their herds. And, and that's happening more and more. And some of those tools include using calving sheds or barns, uh, using large sheepdogs um, to be out with the animals to protect them, uh, using solar-powered electric fences, um, particularly during the calving um, and lambing season. Um, there's just quite a few different tools that can be used that address those issues of, of depredation by wildlife without actually going out and poisoning and, and killing them. Um, let's go back to the to the arguments that are made by industry people, whether they work for the government or industry. And, um, and can you go through and rebut a couple, three of their sort of salient articles or arguments? Sure. Well, one of them is that this is just a huge economic uh, damage or, or just a huge economic loss to them, a huge hit. Um, there are far, far, far more animals that die because of disease or lack of abundant uh, forage um, or even extreme weather events. Um, you saw that early freeze and snowstorm that killed tens of thousands of head of cattle when um, you're seeing you know, far, far, far fewer numbers uh, due to wildlife depredation. In fact, there's a new report out that uh, the depredation numbers in uh, Minnesota have dropped um, significantly in the last year. Uh, so those numbers just aren't necessarily accurate. Oh, and, and there's... This reminds me of, um, sorry to interrupt, this, sure. this whole, their, their claims of, of huge losses. I, I studied a case, I think it was last year. I don't know, did you know about the McCurvin family in the Diamond Dam Ranch in Washington when they had the, the state kill an entire pack of wolves because of their horrible losses to wolves? Do you know about this? Um, I don't know all the details, but I have heard about it. Yeah, it's a pretty nasty one. And there were there were quotes. I, I just looked up. I wrote an article about this, and there were there were some quotes from from the family about the terrible losses that they'd had. And they said, "quote We can't operate with the kind of losses we're seeing." And they claim to have lost 12 cattle, quote, killed or injured by wolves. And then it ends up, first off, that they included injuries like a scratch, and there were actually only a couple cows killed at all. And mm -hmm. the important thing here. Is remember they, they said they lost 12 wolves and that was going to drive them out of business. But what the article didn't mention, it only took me about 15 minutes of poking around to find out, is that the um, the uh, they run about 5,000 cattle, which means that even if we take all 12 of those as a loss, that's a completely trivial loss. 12 cows out of 5,000 and. Honestly, if you're a business and you can't afford 0.2% losses, you know, you're doing something wrong. And we well, see that true. sort of thing, I think, quite often. It is. Uh, and there's a selective uh, highlighting of information. Uh, and you see a lot of claims that um, a kill is made by a, a wolf with very, very little evidence that that's the case where sometimes the carcasses are so old that uh, the wildlife services agents will actually rehydrate them and try, and there's a lot of science out there really criticizing the scientific methods um, that are used. In fact, uh, the, the paper that they rely on or the system that they say they use is over 40 years old uh, to attribute kills to wolves. Um, 
Um, so there's a lot of questioning of whether there's real scientific integrity um, when we're talking about attribution of kills to wolves and other species. Um, and there's a lot of misinformation out there about these high numbers. Uh, you're, you see a lot more loss in a um, CAFO type situation, a concentrated animal feeding operation where there's a huge amount of disease. Um, but it's also true that a lot of these businesses are on the margin, um, that they're not particularly profitable. And so they like to blame wildlife for um, them being in such a precarious financial situation. But that has a lot to do with lots of other factors. Um, like you said, if, if your business is, is so on the line that the loss of one or two head out of a multi-thousand head um, herd of cattle is, is going to put you over the brink, then, um, then you were in trouble to begin with. Well, and yes, and in that case, um, also the state of Washington would pay double market value for every cow lost to a wolf kill, which mm -hmm. means from a business perspective, of course, that, that they would actually want for the wolf to kill all their cattle because then they would get twice market value for them. But the the, the rancher in that case said he refused the compensation and said the only compensation he's interested in is seeing dead wolves. Right. Well, and that goes back to this really uh, deep-seated there's some real hatred and fear mythology around wolves, and there's a lot that's been written about it. It's a really interesting story uh, about the demonization of wolves, and and I just fundamentally don't understand it. I certainly don't understand folks who uh, go shoot a wolf and take a picture and then go home and cuddle with their German shepherd by the fire. Uh, it's a really odd thing, and and we work um, and, and know lots of folks who identify as ethical hunters who say there's no such thing as ethically hunting an animal you have no intention of eating. Uh, and so it's an interesting targeting and mythology around wolves specifically. You know, there's also there's a couple other mythologies we're seeing that have no real basis. In fact, one of them is the idea that wolves kill for fun and that they kill more animals than that they than they need to, uh, and that they leave large percentages of the kill. Um, that's just not borne out in fact. Um, the only time that we saw wolves doing that was actually a response to humans doing something similar to what you mentioned before, which was humans coming in and poisoning kills. And wolves are such smart animals that they learned that it wasn't safe to go back. Um, to an earlier kill that they hadn't been sitting on because animals were dying or getting sick after being poisoned. And so there was a period where uh, so the wolves would not come back to feed a second time. But biologists in Yellowstone have seen wolves come back and feed on a carcass up to a year after a kill. They they certainly are not wasteful animals. Um, and the, the another mythology that we're hearing is that they're disease vectors, that they're spreading tapeworm, and, and that also is just not borne out by the science or by anecdotal evidence. Um, there's a recent interview with Doug Smith, who's the head of the Wolf Reintroduction Program in Yellowstone, who just said if anyone was going to be exposed to tapeworm by being close to wolves, it would be him because he's lead on the collaring effort and uh, is in the field in very close contact with wolves and their bodily fluids uh, quite frequently and, and has not done that. So and veterinarians will tell you there's just no basis in fact. But that kind of mythology is the sort of thing where people hear it enough and they think it's fact even when it's just absolutely not. And, and it's dangerous too because you see journalists printing those claims without um, finding out whether they're valid. And that adds to this really irrational fear and uh, and targeting and demonization of, of some of these species. I think I think that it's not just a, I think that there's a there's an, an extraordinary fear and hatred of, of wolves, but I think that extends um, to a lot of other creatures too. And I'm thinking of like prairie dogs and the mass mm -hmm. poisoning of them and the demonization of them too. And this may not be a fair, well, it's a fair question, but I don't know if it's one you want to talk about. Do you want to talk about, and if you don't, it's perfectly okay, we'll go to something else, uh, 
do you want to talk about it all the sort of the reason I put in the caveat is because you just said that this is something that you can understand. So that that's why the question isn't really fair. Do you want to talk at all about that? I mean, speculate at all on the what you think might be some of the causes of this sort of demonization of of all these other creatures, from prairie dogs to rattlesnakes to coyotes to wolves to crows to you know. I just I just in my neighborhood where I live. I live in far northern California. And I've seen mountain lion tracks here before once, and then one of my neighbors just heard a mountain lion the other night, and that's all I think is really exciting. But then sure. some other neighbor was saying, "Well, there's, you know, that's yeah, exciting if that means that you're, you know, if you're going to wet your pants because you're so scared." And I mean, do you? Is there anything you want to say about any of this sort of demonization of all these non-human others? Well, I think a lot of it, unfortunately, just comes out of ignorance. And some of this mythology is rooted in uh, in religious symbolism, in, in wolves at a certain point in the Catholic Church were the embodiment of the devil, and snakes are, uh, you know, they were the temptress to, to um, Adam and Eve, and, uh, and it's a really interesting thing how far back some of that mythology goes. And wolves, it's such an interesting one. You you try to find some positive connotations to wolves, and it's not. It's the big bad wolf um, luring little Red Riding Hood in, in our children's stories. And so it's the kind of thing that um, that fear-based mentality and the use of animals in uh in fairy tales and in religion that really creates this grounding in society that's a, that's really uh, against wildlife. And it's a sad state of affairs because the biological reality, the ecological reality, is that they play key roles in the landscape, and they're important to the health of ecosystems that not only they depend on, but we depend on. And it's it's something that should be celebrated that the National Park Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service realize that the only way to really ever have balance again in the predator-prey relationship and in the ecosystem in the greater Yellowstone Basin was to bring the apex carnivore back, the one that they were responsible for eradicating, you know, 70 years before. Uh, they, they said, we can't we're never going to have this ecosystem in real balance without um, the apex carnivore. And, and they brought the wolves back, and they have seen more benefits to that return than anyone ever anticipated. And it's an effect that biologists call the trophic cascade. And it's when you have an apex carnivore return to an ecosystem, and the, the benefits of that species' presence cascade through the web of life, really. So in, in Yellowstone, it's manifest that um, the elk population, which was acknowledged to be just hugely overpopulated, and the deer population were brought back into uh, a better carrying capacity for the land, and they were then not destroying all the riparian areas and eating all the aspen and, and the willow, and that meant that beavers came back into the streams and there was more shade for fish and for songbirds, and the wolves actually uh, kept the coyote populations under control, which then meant rodent populations rebounded a bit, and fox came back because there and and falcons and other uh, other birds of prey were had more food sources. And, and the latest science is actually that the wolves are really helping the grizzly bears because the bears are really impacted by climate um, where we're seeing these infestations of the white bark pine beetle and big die off of the trees and and the um, white bark pine is a big food source for the grizzlies so they're really in trouble because of that but the wolves um, make kills that then the grizzlies come and share um, and that's really helping the grizzly population rebound so um, I think a lot of it is really rooted in ignorance and myth and tradition um, where folks just don't know or don't learn or don't want to believe uh, how important, in fact, these animals are to ecosystems. And you're absolutely right, Derek. The prairie dog is a, a huge, huge example of this where 
they're absolutely key. Um, we call their uh, ecosystem the prairie dog empire um, because prairie dogs uh, have over 150 different species that are dependent on them and on the habitat that they provide, uh, including the burrowing owl and swift and kit foxes and the ferruginous hawk and the critically imperiled black-footed ferret. Those species can't survive without prairie dogs, and we've wiped prairie dogs from between 95 and 98% of their historic habitat um, throughout these ecosystems, um, and it's a huge loss, and we're still seeing widespread poisoning, widespread target-hunted uh, for fun kind of hunting practices, contest hunts um, for these animals and, and lethal control uh, methods. Um, and we work as much as we can to prevent that from happening. And and we've had some real successes with that. We worked with Telluride, the community of Telluride, and some local activists to uh, to develop a non-lethal management plan. And Telluride was able to raise the money to purchase um some land out just outside of town that, that they refer to as the valley that um, they wanted to have be free open green space and there were some interests that really wanted to lethally remove prey dogs that moved into that space and they worked with the community to prevent that from happening and they, so they've seen um, the return of bobcats and burrowing owls and Persian attack and all these other amazing animals um, because they've pretty much left the prairie dogs alone. So I loved what you said about Yellowstone. Let's go let's go just step by step cuz I think I think it can it, it can be a little bit confusing especially if we sure. if we live in a city or if we don't. <laughs> so yep. basically if wolves if you don't have as many wolves then that means that there's less predation on deer and elk and if there's more deer and elk then the deer and elk eat Basically, among other things, they would eat baby cottonwoods or baby willows. Mm-hmm. And yep. if you have not so many willows, then that means that what's the next step? So then you don't necessarily have enough shade to provide habitat for um, species, native fish species, or habitat for native songbirds. Um, you don't see as much beaver activity, and beavers are incredibly key ecosystem engineers. Um, they provide habitat for all sorts of other species. Um, so it's a, it is. It's a very interesting cascade through the ecosystem of these impacts. So taking out one species like that can, I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't think that removing, well, you would if you really thought about it, but if you didn't think about it, you wouldn't think that removing wolves would have an effect on trout or right. but it, it ends up doing so and then like you said the wolves kill coyotes and or reduce their population in one way or another and that means that there can be more rodents is that what you were saying yeah um, there's some indications of that it's not 100 um, percent accepted that that's necessarily happening but there's a lot of, uh, of study into whether you see then um, there's some more rodent populations, which means there's more food for swift and kit and red and mountain foxes, um, and also for uh, for birds of prey um, like peregrine falcons, like bald and golden eagles um, that need those those rodent uh, species. And wolves don't kill very many coyotes; so it's not very common, but they definitely uh, take over habitat and um, they keep coyotes more on the move. Um, and then the coyotes uh, can shift their attention to other prey species. Um, you know, thank you for thank you for correcting me because it shows. You know, I, I work on these issues all the time, but it shows how deeply embedded can be our this culture's mythology. Because mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the culture's mythology t- teaches us that you know nature is red in tooth and claw, and basically everybody's killing everybody. But right. That's. I've seen this. You know, I I live with bears. I live with with all sorts of other creatures here, and John Livingston um, really was the one who helped me understand that in the real world nobody really wants to fight very often, and you usually only kill for prey for to eat. And other right. than that, basically, 
almost everything consists basically of displays and sort of, you know, so the wolves would be much more likely to simply, for the most part, make the coyotes uncomfortable. That makes a lot right. more sense ecologically for everybody. Yeah, and I actually watched it happen. I, I got to be in Yellowstone last week and was watching the Lamar Canyon alpha male and female, and they'd made a kill, and um, they alpha male and female. And the the male was taking a nap, but the female was near the carcass, and she was not happy about a couple of coyotes venturing in, hoping they could get a bite. And, and she chased the smaller one off and kind of gave it a nip, and they had a, a little tete-a-tete with some hissing, but... She doesn't have any interest in killing that coyote. That doesn't do her any good. And really, it's a waste of energy for her. It's a waste of calories. Um, she just wants to make sure that her meal is there for her. And, and they've, they've also, scientists have also uh, shown that ravens, which are exceptionally smart birds, they actually will, not only will they follow wolves to prey, um, and they've learned to watch for the wolves, uh, because both both um, magpies and ravens, their beaks are not strong enough to break through the hide of a large ungulate like a, an elk or um, bison. So they need the wolf to break open the, the carcass in order to feed. So you see the ravens and the, the magpies arrive when, uh, when a grizzly or a wolf makes a kill. Um, and you will often watch literally dozens of animals who are eating from this carcass. I was in Yellowstone last summer and um, actually witnessed five wolves and five bears feeding on the same carcass, which is very rare, um, but was a, just a, such a clear example of um, what ecosystem services these wolves are are playing in. So it's a very interesting thing, and actually they they have shown now, scientists have shown, that the ravens will actually lead wolves to a carcass. So what, perhaps an animal that's died of natural causes, um, a fall or a broken leg or something like that, um, the ravens will actually get the wolves to come and eat so that they break open the carcass so then the birds can eat. It's really an amazing thing. Yeah, I think I think the real world is a lot more amazing and and wonderful than we normally imagine. So we have it about... Is. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, it's interesting on a... I don't like to have these um, conversations based purely in economics because I, I believe in the fundamental and intrinsic right of, of these animals to exist on the landscape uh, without the threat of, of human um, lethal control. But um, the, if you do look purely at the numbers, the amount of money that's spent on wildlife watching, totally non-lethal um, viewership, and the number of people who come to see these animals in the wild far, far outpaces um, any numbers that you see around claims of damage due to um, these wildlife species. It's, it's in the tens of millions of dollars and the hundreds and thousands of visitors who come to see these animals. Well, thank you for saying that, and thank you also for being explicit that um, the economics aren't aren't primary. Um, so we have about about two minutes, and um, first I want to I want to read something from uh, the Wild Earth Guardians website, which is that in um, fiscal year 2011, Wildlife Services claimed it killed a total of 3.8 million reported animals. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I saw somewhere, I can't see it right now, but I saw somewhere that, oh, the agency spends over $100 million each year. And yep. so I just want to mention those things. You know, in a, in a time when people are losing their unemployment and when, um, you know, they have a sequester because they say they're spending too much money, they still have $100 million to spend to kill 3.8 million reported animals. Um, so I guess what I'd like to end with is, is I mean, Thank you, A, first thank you for your work, and B, what would you want people who, um, in a short-term and longer-term, both short-term and long-term perspectives, what would you like for people who hear this interview to walk away with and to do? Sure. Well, it'd be great to 
come and visit our website, read more about it. We have lots of information specifically about wildlife services and the, the larger what we call the War on Wildlife. So you can visit the website at www.wildearthguardians.org, uh, and you can sign up for our action alerts. That we often have uh, various actions that you can take, sometimes at a local, sometimes at a state, often at a federal level. Um, and talk to your elected leaders about defunding wildlife services. There have been some legislative efforts. They unfortunately haven't gotten as far as we would like. Uh, Representative DeFazio of Oregon has introduced legislation twice now to really um, significantly look at what's going on with wildlife services and, and pull funding from this incredibly cruel um, program uh, of the USDA um, and make sure that your elected leaders know about it. We find sometimes that um, senators and Congress people don't even know that this is a line item in the budget um, that should never survive. So uh, talk to us about it, visit the website, get involved, and write letters to your editor and and be really careful when you're recreating on public lands. Look for signs about M44s. Keep your companion animals on leashes. Um, we would hate to have you be a, a victim of, uh, of one of these horrible poisons. Well, thank you so much for your work. And I would like to thank, um, and thank you for being on the show. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. And my guest today has been Bethany Cotton. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.